Good day, folks. This is Greg Judy at Green Pastures Farm. Today, uh, Jan and I had a few minutes, and she's always uh, making a list of uh, question and answer sessions. So, I guess we kind of call this a lightning round. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he never knows what I'm going to throw at him. So. I don't know what she's going to ask me, so we're just going to ad lib it and go. Yeah. So, so, what's your first deal? The first question was, on Jack's property that we just bought, what was the organic matter when we got it, and what do you think it is now and what is the pH of the soil and what have we done to that property? Yeah, so we, we leased Jack's, um, it was the second farm that we leased. Uh, the lifetime lease we got in 1999 and Jack's would have been in the year 2000. And uh, we pulled soil samples on that. And um, I think that particular farm we were at like uh, less than half a percent especially down in the bottoms uh, that they've been row cropping it and so they plowed it conventional tillage and when we got it we put it in grass and it's been in grass ever since and uh some of that over there is up over three three percent now in in organic matter um we're pretty tickled with that um we've kept the farm covered uh now that we bought it the we did go in alignment last fall and we put down a little bit of phosphorus you couldn't afford very much it's so expensive um, but we put down about 80, the soil test called for like 160 pounds per acre, and uh, we put down 80. And um, then we put down about 40 pounds of, of potassium and no nitrogen. Nitrogen we don't need, we got the cows. Right, but, right. So what do you think the pH was? Well, right. I don't think, we know, we took soil samples. Um, the pH was in the fives. So it was like 5.7 to 5.8. And there was some broom sedge, and there was another grass in there we call wire grass. It's a really unpalatable, it's a sign of poor soil. And so this year, uh, I'm, this winter, uh, I had Isaac uh, and the boys, we placed, I believe it's 38 bales over there, 1,200 pound bales, net wrapped. And uh, we fed it, we unrolled it on that farm. It's the first time we've ever been able to do that in the wintertime. And that's because the other improvement we made there and we bought it, we've always had a pipeline on it above ground. So it was laid three quarter inch uh, polyethylene. We just laid it on top of the ground underneath the fence. And we had these quick couplers, plastic quick couplers, we plugged our water into. Well, this is all fed, pressurized off of county water. In the wintertime, we had to drain it. We, we, we just couldn't use it. We, we actually didn't drain it. We just unhooked it from its source, took the quick couplers off and just left it. Well, we bought it, we had a plumber or a, a, a guy come in with a trencher and we trenched it in about 24 inches deep. We put quick couplers about every 500 feet. And that's how long our pipe is. We bought 500 foot rolls and so we'd run out with the roll, we just put a coupler on it. And they're buried in the ground, they got caps on it. So this winter, when we brought the cattle through there, now instead of just shooting through there in the fall and saying bye-bye to that farm until spring, we fed hay on it. And uh, it's going to be extremely exciting to see what happens over there because it's never had this treatment before. Um, the other thing we did is, now that we owned it, we took out all the fence. It has some barbed wire fence running through the middle of it. We didn't, it was in the way. And Isaac looked at that one day and said, great, why, why don't we just take that out? And it wasn't just a, an old fence. This was a six strand high tensile barbed wire fence that kept the roll crop land away from the pasture. We took it out, took all of it out, rolled it all up. And um, man, it opened up so much flexibility with our hot wire. Now we can, when we fenced off the creek um, with a hot wire fence and took all that barbed wire out. And it's just nice to have a, a big open painting that we can use the poly wire as a paintbrush. Canvas. Yeah, canvas and yeah, and, and move the animals around different a different design each time we come onto the farm. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting. Yeah. Um, do we have any troubles with groundhogs chewing hoses or pipes? First off, we don't really have groundhogs. Oh, well, we got groundhogs. Uh, we got lots of groundhogs. But they they're they're underneath buildings, um, You'll see them out, uh, and they're in old fence rows and things, but we don't have the groundhogs bothering our plumbing yet, and I hope we don't, but, but I know people that say that they do. 
No, we don't have that. Yeah. Um, how many hours do our cattle spend grazing to lying around? Well, typically, uh, when you move the cows, now we're talking about grazing. So, in the summertime, you go out there, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning to move them. So there'll be some up grazing. But as soon as you move them, they're all grazing on you know, to their new pasture. And they'll graze for about two hours, um, two and a half, three hours. And they'll go lay down and ruminate. And then they may get up at 11 o'clock that morning or, or 1 o'clock and go out and graze again. And then they graze at night and you move them again. And that's why we move our cows twice a day is they are uh, more apt to graze when they get new forage. They just like it. Yeah. Um, do you notice, I guess the question, I'm, I'll just paraphrase it. Um, if you, I guess what they mean is if you have good grass, will the cattle eat less or spend less time grazing? Okay, so let me explain that a little bit. Um, so the higher the quality of the forage, and the more palatable you keep it, in other words, don't let it get real tall where it just turns into wood. It's like feeding them a cedar tree. There's not much protein. Fiber, or a lot of fiber. There's not, not any energy in it. That animal's going to lay down, and this going to take a while for her gut to ruminate that. And it's just so darn coarse. So the more palatable you can keep your forage, the quicker she's going to ruminate, and she's going to get hungry again, she's going to get up and eat again. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to put weight on your animals. Whether she's pregnant or she's nursing a, a young calf, uh, the, the, the more palatable the forage, the quicker your calf is going to grow and the more milk she's going to produce. And she's going to breed back. She's going to stay in good body condition. Well, not only that, the calves start eating the grass when they're younger. Yeah, absolutely. They, they learn in like, seven, seven to ten days. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if it's palatable. Yep, by watching mom. You're right. If it's palatable, they're going to eat it. If it's wood, they're not. Right. Um, so next question. When calling sheep, what is our criteria? Who stays and who goes? Yeah, so you know, the time we call our sheep is usually in August. When we get all of our sheep up and the, and the ewe lambs and the ram lambs, they kind of go through them and sort. And that's usually when we have our, our production sale in the fall, early fall. And uh, any you that is uh, showing any signs of, you know, there's, you can just tell they're, they're getting a little older. Um, they're, uh, they just don't have the flesh on them that they should have. Because, you know, we, we, these sheep are being moved every two days. And uh, so they're getting good forage. And somebody mentioned the other day on YouTube, so, you know, you're probably not pressuring that much if you move them every two days. Folks, you're in the business to put on weight. Now, you want to pressure your sheep and kill half of them because you didn't move them. That's your business, but you're not going to make any money if you kill all your sheep. You need to move them. And I'm getting this from uh, some people that, you know, are in the cattle business, too. They're, they're having trouble with their cows. And you get a picture of them, you're like, oh, my gosh. You should have known three months ago you were in trouble. You're not giving them enough to eat. And sometimes people buy land that doesn't have productive grass on it at all, and they turn cattle out on it, and they expect those cows to make a living on it, and they can't. The, the grass just isn't good enough, your soils. So for me, you know, if I'm going to buy a really poor, broken-down farm, you need to start working on that soil a little bit by either unrolling hay on it, maybe put a little lime on it, or get some animals on it, start tramping some of that carbon on the ground. It's, it will get better over time. But in nature, things work slower, and so it's gonna take some time. And I think we all get impatient. But watch the condition on your animals, folks. If you can see hip bones and, and bones sticking out of the backs of your sheep or your cows, they're not magically gonna get fat if you keep doing what you're doing. And in the wintertime especially, right now, I've got people you know, sending me these emails, making comments, what should I do, what should I do? I think my cows are dropping weight, and, you know, the stock pile's not very good anymore. I'm like, you better get a protein lick out there. And and there's no shame in that. I mean, we we do that. In... We haven't done it yet. Not with the cows. The no. sheep. And the sheep we get it, but the cows don't get protein. But I mean, lick. but you don't want them dying. Nope. We're not in the dying business. If you're feeding pretty darn good hay, what I'm talking about, hay that wasn't rained on, it doesn't have mold in it, it was cut right. You shouldn't have to feed protein to your cows if you feed if you're unrolling some hay out there. Uh, the stockpile this time, you know, those bowls over there, 
they're not getting anything but stockpile fescue, but it's good stockpile. I mean, it, you know, it's that tall, and then bulls can go in there and pick out what they want. There's 41 bulls in that mob, and they're doing, they're knocking it out of the park. I think they're putting on a pound or two pounds a day on that stuff, and here we are into February. Right. So, yep. Yeah. Um, one more t question. Um, I see some of our cows have horns. Are they short horn? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so the question is the ones that have horns, are they short horn? Uh, I've had ladies, not, I'm not picking on ladies, but ladies especially, like, that's a bull. It's got horns on. No, just because an animal has horns on doesn't make it a bull. The, the horn cows in our herd are from some three quarter south bulls that I bought. Uh, gosh, that was in uh, 2013, the year after the, the once in a hundred year drought. And some of those cows had some horns on them. And, that's where that came from. And they still drop good calves. I'm going to keep them. We don't sell any of those as breeding stock. We'll sell them as a steer. Or if it's a really nice heifer, she's got little horns on, I'll keep her and just get calves. We call those calf getters. Yep. Um, one, one more question. Um, why don't we plant fruit trees, oaks, and walnuts instead of uh, the, the locusts? The honey locusts. The honey locusts. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, against doing that. Uh, the, the problem, one of the issues I have with uh, fruit trees, of course, is they don't get big enough to provide meaningful shade. A uh, honey locust, you get a good one up and going, those darn things will grow 80 and 90 feet, and they, they throw out the limbs, and they put out a lot of good passive shade. When I talk about passive shade, I'm talking about small leaves. The sun can get through that down to the grass, okay? So passive shade makes better grass. It's a lower lignin value because it's not getting a full blast of sunlight on the grass. The grass out in the middle of the field where it has no trees around, it has, it, it's got more lignin in it than the, than the grass growing under a tree, just because of the shade. And a honey locust is a legume. It fixes nitrogen, it puts pods on. I, I like honey locusts, but you know, you got to be careful with landowners. You know, we have a lot of lease farms, and on some of those farms, the landowner's like, absolutely not. I want every honey locust on this farm gone, and that's because of the thorns. Right. They get in four wheeler tires, and if you drive your truck out there, you're probably going to get a flat. And and oaks take a very long time. Oaks take a long time. I'm not. I don't have anything against oaks. Matter of fact, best time to plant a tree was yesterday. You ought to plant a few of them, but. Um, the honey locusts, the, the Hershey that we planted last year, um, we found out that some of those are throwing on thorns. Um, we'll see. Yeah, we were a little disappointed in that, but that's just the way it is. You always got to try something new, and that's what we're into doing. We're always trying a new and better way of doing things, and that's what makes farming exciting. Well, Folks, thank, but thank you, Greg. That, that was my last question. Okay. Well, thank you, Jan, for that list. That was a good uh, answer and question in the lightning round. And... Okay. Well, one more thing. Um, so I see there's some new pictures on the wall there. Yeah, you got me that for Christmas. And we had a bull up there on the wall. That's not our breed, but it's one of the breeds. The South Pole is 25% uh, Hereford, Cinepole, Barzona, and Red Angus. Anyway, Jan, Jan got that picture. It's got three heifers. So now the bull on the wall, he's got him three heifers to deal with. And there. there's a couple in that black and white picture, but... You can't see you can't. They, they are in the corner. But um, real quick, what about that bull picture? Yeah, so that, that bull picture, um, that was the standard back in the 1800s. They had them you know, pretty short and squatty. That was a bull that could probably look at grass and get fat. And then we uh, bred leg onto our animals and got a lot of leg and got got rid of the bigger gut. And now we have an animal that takes a lot of grain. Ours don't, but most of the animals today are bred and raised for feedlots because the feedlots feed grain. And they want an animal that's got a lot of leg on so they can feed it a lot of corn and soy uh, to make money, which, you know, that's, that's their prerogative. But for us on the farm raising the animals, that's an animal that's gonna, it's gonna put you out of business. But when when I opened it up, and had them frame it, what was on the back of that picture? Yeah. So the farmer had his whole list of what he had in his herd. He had like thirteen cows, seven steers, I don't know, seven heifers, and 
Yeah, he had a list of his animals on the back from of like that picture. Nineteen twenty something. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. So. Yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Uh, you all knew the channel. Hit that subscribe button. Way up. We appreciate it. And it doesn't cost anything. I have one lady. She keeps asking me, Greg, what's the cost to subscribe? It doesn't cost you anything. <laughs> Just hit subscribe. <laughs> all right, y'all have a good one. We'll see you down the road.